Nyokabi. Joined by the Honorable Priscilla Nyokabi. She is the chairperson of the Center for Multi-Party Democracy, CMD Kenya. Good morning, Priscilla. Good morning, good morning. Good to have you on the show. Happy New Year. Thank you. Every time somebody comes and joins us for the first time in the year, you have to say Happy New Year. Even if it's September. Uh, it doesn't yeah. matter. As long as it's... Uh, the first time. No, no, See, it's no, the first no, time you're seeing each other that year. Mm? Okay. It's new. It is yeah. still a new year. Mm. Okay. Glad I'm <laughs> coming in March. <laughs> <laughs> and then you also tell them congratulations for being elected the chairman, the chairperson of CMD Kenya. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. There's a lot of work that CMD Kenya does. We've uh, hosted the previous chairperson and uh, the CEO, <coughs> the executive director as well. Center for Multi-Party Democracy, championing multi-party democracy in the country and all this, the People Dialogue Festival of 2023. What's that about? Tell us. Oh, I think let's start with the CMD, uh, since our multi-party democracy. And, you know, parties have come a long way, a uh, long, long journey, you know, from briefcase parties to my own party to my husband and wife party, to now what we have in the new constitution of Kenya 2010, mm. and also the strengthening of parties since then. Now most of our parties have offices, they have the national governing councils. I mean, I think now we are, we are still not there because our parties are very young. Only ODM has survived through cycles. Uh, we have a journey to go in terms of the, I think our parties are like our companies. They, they die at infancy, uh, but hoping uh, that, uh, Priscilla, that will change. Then the PDF. Ford Kenya has survived mm. through yes. cycles. Yes, sure. Kanu too, actually. <laughs> Ford, Asili, and Kanu. And Kanu, and Kanu too. Yeah. So, uh, so we're almost there. Mm. Kenu, I think, uh, Ford Kenya. Uh, now, even small parties like the DP yeah. could have survived longer. Mm. Uh, so anyway, so it's a journey of political parties. Mm. And one of the mm. things that the dialogue does... Uh, is to bring that conversation to the people and to make it a festival. So there's a bit of celebration around the festival part, but there's also the discussion around political awareness. And you know, Kenya is one place where everybody has a political idea. We surprise the Muzungus when they come here, from the taxi driver <laughs> to the saloonist to the barber to the you know kiosk person. Everybody is politically aware. Mm. Where does that political awareness take us as a country? And what goodies do we deliver? You have to remember that democracy is not an end in itself. Democracy is supposed to deliver development. Is our democracy uh, delivering development? Is our democracy delivering to the poor people? And we've just seen the beginning of populist politics, as it were, uh, you know, running out. Uh, from uh, Brexit to the UK, US in, in Trump, and now to Kenya with, with the, the party that has won. Uh, what does that mean uh, for the future of democracy? Are uh, those new threats? And, and then here in Kenya, we have what we call signature dialogues. Where are our homegrown solutions? Uh, the seat of the official opposition. You know, we are in a pure presidential system, the American model, uh, where you don't even have ministers come out to the floor of parliament for questioning. But we were so used to the old parliamentary system. And, 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 and in law, we call it a mongrel. We have since learned how to take the best of all these systems and, and put it in here. Mm. So this leader of official position, might it be time to consider a homegrown solution that allows us to get the best of the ideas that there can be? I mean, I think that the former prime minister has good ideas, but giving those good ideas on the street is not as good for democracy. Why can't he give those good ideas on the floor of parliament and come and help us fight corruption uh, as the leader of official position? So those signature dialogues, the two-thirds gender rule, uh, all the dialogues that we've had uh, from before, we organize the dialogue in villages. So you have a political village and a party leaders hour. A lot of the party leaders will come. The, the, the speaker of the National Assembly is going to be a key highlight. Mm -hmm. uh, the prime secretary is going to be a key highlight. And many of our political leaders have had uh, a thing with CMD, including the president, uh, when he was a member of Kenu. And then we have the SDGs village. Uh, worrying about political parties and delivery of SDGs, the manifestos. Mm. Are we delivering on SDGs? And then we have the youth village. Uh, they have refused to be leaders of tomorrow. They are now leaders of today. Uh, what do they think about this democracy and how will it deliver jobs for them? Then we have the International Women's Day on, on 8th of March. So the gender debate and, and a lot of political leaders are going to be there, uh, both at national level and devolution, and then a lot of development partners. The idea was originated from Sweden. Uh, where they hold it in an island. Even here in Kenya, we are starting to explore the idea of holding it outside of Nairobi. Mm. And then it went to Denmark. 
and then the EU and Netherlands and there's a lot of civil society partners. I particularly like the Scandinavians because they have small parties like the one that I come from now, Jubilee mm. Party, uh, with 33 members of parliament. In Scandinavian countries, that's, that's, uh, that's a big party. Mm. We are obsessed with numbers here. There they are not obsessed with numbers. They are obsessed with quality of representation, impact. climate change impact here. Mm. Here we are obsessed with numbers. Mm. That's why we take all these MPESA numbers and all that. Mm. You know, we shouldn't be obsessed with numbers. We should be obsessed with quality representation and quality of debates uh, so that even a party like the one that I belong to now, Jubilee Party, we should be worried about what impact are we going to make mm -hmm. uh, in the country, you know, post election. Mm. In actually, the first discussion is that post-election, what impact do we make with mm. our political parties? I'm interested to note, uh, Priscilla, even as this um, festival comes into place, that will there be an opportunity to discuss this very thing that you've just said and now open it up beyond a mention? Because political parties, unfortunately, it seem to be the vehicles through which then an, a candidate will be delivered, as opposed to being a vehicle through which this impact, this ideology then will be brought to life, that those who then invest and believe in a particular ideology then can come and through the party live it out in whatever positions they find, at whatever level. Can you see a situation whereby it will evolve into the original idea of what a political party should actually do as opposed to just being a deliver uh, you know d a delivery mechanism for an individual but an impact of quality in terms of governance can that conversation take or does it take center stage I think it will it will take center stage because all the parties have an exhibition and all the parties are encouraged to sort of recruit new members because what happens in Kenya, while we are political, we are not members of political parties. We have political ideas, yeah. we have political views, but mm. we are not members of political party. So I think it is time now to take that conversation a little bit further uh, that you're not just... You don't just have political idea, but, but you're a member of a political party. And as a member of a political party, some rights come to you, including what your party does, what your party represents, so that we stop this individual uh, individual nature of parties, you know, so that the party is not just for the party leader, that the party is beyond the party leader. And then the party leaders also, uh, as party founders, they're going to have to release these parties. You founded the party, yes, but now the party has members. Please allow the members uh, to exercise uh, part of that conversation. We're seeing the early signs of it uh, with, for example, Devolution Party, you know, a party mm -hmm. that is themed on devolution. Mm -hmm. uh, we have the early signs of it in the party of Isaac Ruto. Roots remember party. when he was a <laughs> Jacoya Roots Party, yes. Mm -hmm. I, that one I personally don't agree with Chama some of the Chama ideas. Chama Chama mm -hmm. So we are, I, I think that we are on the early uh, conversations around that. But also for the country, which is the part about the ORPP and the IBC, mm -hmm. how many parties should we ideally also have? Because now I think on record we have 91 parties, uh, but I mean the population and then many of them are not even active. So maybe this thing about parliamentary political parties mm -hmm. uh, that you you have actually some members in parliament. And, and uh, I would say we still maybe in another 10, 20 years it should get better. We are watching the UDA very closely. Uh, seeing how that's going to unfold. Uh, they are already early fears because once it becomes a humongous, you know, I don't know what the president is on to, the, the size alone will just will knock you out. Uh, so I don't know I don't know whether that is going to give us a CCM or give us an ANC. We were there it with will, Jubilee. It will give us Jubilee. It, it, it explode. <laughs> mm. uh, ODM, Baba, uh, has uh, maintained a bit of a neat political party. So it's to see how ODM, for example, has institutions, internal party democracy. So we are on the early signs of it. Mm. Priscilla, do yeah. we need political parties, really? I mean, or do we just need ideas? Like you've said, every Kenyan has a political idea mm. and they're thinking something politically but all those kenyans no political parties exist they don't belong to parties it's only a small minority that belongs to parties and it's because they're interested in something they're either going to vie for a seat or they have somebody close to them who needs to vie and so they sign up so that the, the person can uh, have following then do we need political parties? Yes. If we are maturing as a democracy mm. and we are maturing in plurari plurality of thought, mm -hmm. must it be housed in a vehicle called a political party? Can't we have other ways of having groupings of political ideas? I think both ideas are valid. It's only that in our constitution we are a party democracy. We are a political party democracy. In fact, we, there is no other way. 
independent candidates, uh, even what in law you call confused candidates. Uh, you, we are a party democracy. You really must belong to a party. And politics is a game of numbers. Uh, so there's no other way. Once you go into politics in the manner in which you practice it, and, and you are a party democracy by the design of our constitution, majority party, minority party, uh, the coalitions, there is no other way. The only way you get into resources and into sharing the national kitty, uh, deciding how much money is going to water, how much is going to health, how much is going to go to security, there is no other way. You have to be a member of a political party and you have to have some political party grouping. The other groupings, the civil society partners, and, and, and many of them are going to be in this dialogue can offer their views and can bring their views onto the parliamentary democracy. But the parliamentary democracy we practice here is party-based. Okay. Yeah. That party, mm -hmm. though, is designed in a certain way that we are mirroring and copying what's happening in the West, mm -hmm. in the Western democracies, which are themselves flailing right now. Now, if you look at the way we structured our constitution, yes, you're going to have political parties, you're going to have independent candidates who feel that none of the parties represent their ideals and ideologies that they come with but the constitution does not tell us as citizens that we must belong to a party it only tells us that we shall elect people based on their parties people are not joining parties we push for political political parties to you know increase the number of political parties but we do not join those parties perhaps it's sometime a, a conversation we ought to have going back into our constitution how can we, how else can we exercise our democracy without calling a vehicle a political party? Yeah, there's a bit of a misnomer there in the sense that Article 38 allows all of us to be members of parties. It allows us to exercise our political rights. And I think the Constitution foresaw that problem. So you can exercise your political rights alone or in association uh, yes. with other people. The best for a democracy, for example, for the issues that we need to discuss, means that you're in association with other people. If you want to have water, I know it's a conversation also for us women, because you will be out there waiting for water for a hundred years. The only time you will get water is if you go to parliament and you put water in the budget. Yep. Then, like in Nyeri, where I come from, in Kieni, where we need the Narumoro water dam and the Karimenu dam, there is no other way. It has to be the parliamentarians that put that money in the budget. So, if you are a woman who wants water, if you want health, NHIF, you want devolved functions. You have to be in a political party so that some of these conversations can then get articulated there. So one of the challenges we have is how do we make our very political citizens then become members of political parties? And that's what the dialogue tries to do, to link the political party conversations with yourself. You as a young people, if you want to change um, discourse in our country, like the 8 million who did not register for the vote and the another 8 million who did not show up for voting, you will be, you know, complaining about all these problems, but you didn't even take part in trying to solve them because the first thing at solving those problems is electing the right leaders. You elect the right leaders through political parties. So that's the conversation. In fact, these are the conversations of the dialogue, and that is why as many Kenyans as possible should come. Uh, see what happens in political parties, see the party leaders, see the sort of drives that the party leaders uh, get into, and come in to the villages that then interest you, and even have difficult conversations around some of the issues that are on debate in the country. You know, it's assumed that uh, <clears throat> if we're talking about uh, determining a winner in a a political contest is not by the details of the percentage of voters who actually registered to vote and or the ones who actually took part in the election but you look at the number of votes cast just that and who gets the most yes it speaks and it tells you of the votes cast the person who actually won is the one who got the most votes or the votes cast and yet a complete conversation cannot exist unless you look at those who didn't vote because not voting is also a statement and it speaks really loudly now it could be that people are happy with the system so they do not see why they should bother voting after all everything is working well or the complete converse they are completely disinterested and disengaged and they're not going to bother now if we focus just on the votes cast I think we may be missing the very, very communication that needs to be looked at with regards to what we need to do in order to get people interested. Either which way. Because if things are good, then are you saying they can't be better? If things are completely bad, then are we saying that 
that message being sent is one that does not require looking into so that it can be improved upon so that these people can actually get interested are we also just ignoring and say okay eight thousand eight million did not vote so or are we going to find out why they didn't vote what reasons because whatever people do they do so for a reason and unless you ask them you'll not know why they did it so when you talk about this and you're talking about party democracy then you have to question how is it democracy when a sizable number of people as you say participate by not participating how is it then democracy or what sort of democracy is it mm. that's true the democracy i think is in the law in the sense that we don't have compulsory voting. Mm. Some countries have actually now forced compulsory voting. But I think if you look at the freedoms in our constitution, I don't think that we want to go that way. It's already bad enough <laughs> that they are not voting voluntarily. I don't mm. think forcing them is going to make them any better. So there is a disconnect. It is true that uh, you do have a political party system. Uh, you do have parties. Uh, people seem to know that they should have political ideas, but then are not getting to be members. The only other thing that is giving us consolation is the Twitter conversation for example the 8 million who didn't show up for the voters card the ones who didn't register and the 8 million who did not show up after registering were largely in the 18 to 24 age bracket and 24 to 35 age bracket these age brackets are very active on twitter so they are exercising their freedom of expression so that question why are they not joining parties there is the sense of hopelessness and i think this should worry all our leaders across the divide why would young people feel hopeless about mm. their own country that they don't feel the need and you know some of them these days the polling stations are in every primary school uh, so for people not to go a kilometer and a kilometer and a half uh, to cast the vote i think that that should worry this democracy but as far as the law is concerned it is just that we have uh, uh, voluntary voting so you have to actually go and vote and 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 systems electoral systems are sophisticated by the way it's interesting in kenya here with all our server problems and all our you know <laughs> not accepting the results we have one of the most sophisticated electoral systems in africa uh, very very and, and i personally because i participated in the last election as a senator this one you couldn't even know if if it is true votes were stolen as it is rumored it was really invisible because you had your agents you had the votes you had the transmission so we are getting better and and hoping that the ibc that we get we're getting us better in that at direction. what exactly we're getting better at the voting system you know <laughs> okay yeah <laughs> Okay. And, uh, <laughs> right. That's great. And the transmission <laughs> system also. Right. We're using yeah. a lot more technology. <laughs> <laughs> I think that we to shikilia tu hapo hapo. We are not there yet, but <laughs> <laughs> and then now direction. worry about <laughs> wale when you kwa hii system, what do we do to yeah. get them in this system? In the system. And especially the young yeah. people. So I want to ask you a question. If you can infer or deduce based on, would you say that looking at other democracies as it were, that people who then are satisfied and we're talking about the basics here make a living being able your livelihood is secure do we find that those then are more active or more participatory in the political process and then to say look this is not just a kenyan issue a just concluded nigerian election where over 50 percent of registered voters did not take place in the political process beyond registering so then are we saying that if your needs are taken care of, can we see a direct correlation between securing of livelihoods and then being active in what many would think is a luxury? I'm not going to deal with that if I cannot eat. Do we see a connection between the two? In fact, ours, I think, is the opposite because it's our middle class that does not quite participate. Mm. It's our middle class that is actually, I think, in Kenya, if truth were told, we have a very lazy middle class because the middle class should be comfortable enough to engage its political leaders. So now what the middle class has done here is to be comfortable with the middle class luxuries. You're comfortable with your golf club, you're comfortable with your Java coffee, and you're comfortable with your internet, you have Wi-Fi, you know. So, and you're unhappy with the system. And you're traveling a bit. Yeah, you're very unhappy with the system. But mm. the system is punishing you badly. In yeah. fact, it punishes you more than it punishes the poor. Mm. Because, at, for example, the fuel, uh, fuel subsidy. The reason the fuel subsidy did not buy it is because it hits the middle class. Um, the poor in this country are very engaged. They are the ones who show up for rallies. In fact, our electoral system, it is the poor that vote. So that is the question that we have even in this dialogue. Mm. Why then is this democracy not delivering for the people who believe right. in it the most? Sure. Be in it. I want to ask the final question because we're coming to the final minute. Uh, of the, uh, yeah, yes, very, but then you go on. The festival mm -hmm. and the conversations that will be taking place. What's the venue? Mm -hmm. And who's invited? Uh, we do it at the Museum Hill.
uh, which allows the different villages to have the space that they need. Okay. Uh, the village, the youth village is going to be very vibrant and we have SDGs champions. Uh, this conversation around the needs mm -hmm. and delivering on the needs of the people, water, health, education, uh, jobs, those conversations are going to be in the villages. So we have a good list of speakers, very, very good speakers coming on. So I want to encourage everyone, everyone is invited to come to the day. This is from everyone. today? It is from tomorrow morning, from, from the tomorrow 8th, morning yeah, until 8th, Saturday. Until tomorrow Saturday. until Saturday. So please, please come. If you want political dialogue, Kuja Pale Museum Hill, so that you can have this and many other conversations and see what can we do for our democracy to deliver. Yeah. Let us talk. People's Dialogue Festival. And let us also celebrate because uh, we are peaceful in this post-election. So it's celebration and dialogue. Thank mm. you. It's okay. always important to talk because if you don't talk, then the other thing, the alternative, is not a sweet one. I've been invited to moderate one of the sessions tomorrow. It's an honor to be there. I'll, I'll be there and I'll be telling you guys what so you, you're coming for. The dialogue. <laughs> Priscilla Nyokabi is the chairperson of the Center for Multi-Party Democracy in Kenya. We're talking about the People Dialogue Festival taking place at the museum from tomorrow until Saturday. All are welcome.